Hi, uh, this is Don Carson, and um, from time to time I'm asked to put together lectures specifically on theme park design or theme entertainment design. And this is one that I put together this last year uh, that focused on research, res researching and reverse engineering um, when it comes to starting a new project. Um, there are a variety of tools that you can use to help you, you know, sort of kick off a project and help you better understand uh, the parameters of um, the assignment that you've been given. Um, and this is really based on the fact that uh, not, not, not always uh, does the client have the information to give you. So sometimes you're given the project but very little information to go on. So rather than waiting around for someone to give you the information, you can uh, start uh, the process of doing your own detective work and uh, getting out there and at least building sort of a library of understanding of where the project could conceivably go. And so there's lots of places that you can look for that information. There are definitely books out there uh, on the topic of um, theme entertainment design. And uh, David Younger's book, the theme park design book, is, is definitely one of them. Um, uh, uh, David's book is definitely one of those books that, uh, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for. Uh, I would love a resource where every bit of information was available to me, and David's book does a lot of that. Um, it is full of a lot of wonderful anecdotes from some amazing Imagineers. So it is definitely something worth having on your bookshelf. But one of the other things you want to do too is you want to start finding inspiration. And there are definitely books out there on theme park design, although many of them sort of just talk about the mystique of it. Um, maybe don't dive really deeply into the nuts and bolts of how to go about doing it. Um, but these books are very valuable and they're, they're definitely worth getting if you can still get them. Um, there's some good stories in them. I'd say of all of them, my, my favorite is the Mark Davis book, um, in his own words. Uh, of course, his work is just stunning and wonderful and what a legacy. But also, the stories remind you that these uh, places have been designed and built by human beings uh, with all their various frailties. And also that a project isn't just one person who comes up with a brilliant idea and then that idea is turned into a, ma a magical classic. Um, all the examples in Mark's book are showing you that it's a group effort, sometimes spanning over you know, many years, even a decade before some ideas actually make it in. And in many cases, the designer uh, finds that some of the ideas that they felt the strongest about don't get in for a variety of reasons. But another place I really recommend you going to find inspiration and uh, concepts is um, in any art of book for just about anything, whether it's a video game or a movie or a series. These books are wonderful in that not only are they full of wonderful artwork, but also they can give you a glimpse into process because many of these books talk about the various degrees of, of concepts they went through before they actually came to the finished design. So, so if you can get your hands on lots of um, art of books, uh, they're always of value to help you better understand how you're going to use your abilities to communicate visually, to um, c communicate your design. Uh, because there's no wrong way or right way, but uh, anything that's going to hone your skills to be able to communicate your concepts uh, will help. And being inspired by how other artists have done it in the past is very valuable. Um, so I really encourage everybody to become their sort of own mental database. So you're going to build your own internal encyclopedic knowledge of the kinds of projects you want to be designing. So attractions and details. I find that a lot of theme park designers have a shorthand. So when someone says, you know, a churro cart, but kind of the style of Peter Pan, but Disneyland's version of Peter Pan, not, you know, Tokyo's. Uh, that's sort of a shorthand that, that, uh, designers use purely because they all have this sort of knowledge, whether they've physically been to these parks or whether they're just very, very familiar with them because they've studied them. So sort of be a, a constantly building up this sort of internal database of this information. So one of the first places you go to when you need inspiration, obviously, would be you would Google it, um, especially uh, Google image searches. Um, it may just be my imagination, but I, I get this feeling that that in the good old days, <laughs> uh, uh, Google image search was very different. Right now, 
you do tend to get a lot of um, things you can purchase up front, but also it's worth knowing that anybody who's looking for uh, a topic is, um, is going to probably pull from the first 100 images uh, so that there is the danger of, of, uh, of the design being very much like how other designers would approach it purely because these images tend to rise to the top. So I do recommend deep diving and also doing a variety of, of searches so that you can um, uh, potentially stumble on stuff that maybe most people wouldn't find. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely use Google, but understand there are lots of other ways in which to find imagery. Um, I, uh, during the pandemic, I, one of the projects I started start, was, was contemplated doing for myself was I wanted to see if I could do sort of a, a, a dark ride design based upon Game of Thrones. And specifically the, the battle at um, uh, Winterfell. And uh, it was going to have a, a blacksmith stop in it as, a shop in it as they're sort of building up for battle. So I initially went and pulled images from the concept work on the film. Um, but then I needed to find more information and sort of educate myself on this particular case of the blacksmith shop as they're sort of building their weapons. And amazingly, in Google, not only did I find images of the actual blacksmith shop, the set taken you know, from the set itself, but also as I dug even deeper, I actually found the prop house where they rented the props that they used in it. So not only did I have pictures of the sets, I actually have pictures of the actual props set against the white background. So Kind of amazing, that doesn't normally happen. Now, granted, these props may have been built for Game of Thrones, and now they're in the prop warehouse that's being offered, um, but it's amazing to see that that anvil and that bellows are the exact anvil and bellows that are being used in the film. So that doesn't always happen, but boy, when it does, that's really great. Um, and also, I recommend that when you're doing your research, sketch your research as well. Yes, you already have images of these various objects, but the act of sketching them starts your brain thinking about how they were constructed. And it also helps you start realizing that there's probably a common language happening in the furnishings and the buildings and the architecture and the props that are specific to that era. So part of this building your mental database uh, is to, to sketch those things you're going to eventually use in maybe a larger environment. Um, it will it'll never be wasted on you. You're just you just like drawing the human figure. You'll get better and better. Um, and also, it's fun, you know, sitting around, you know, maybe at a coffee shop, drawing, you know, blacksmith objects. That's a ball. <laughs> so why not do it? Um, also, uh, I'll find that I uh, am really enjoying starting to do this sort of sketching inside 3D. And in this case, I'm using Google Blocks is a VR sculpting tool. And in about an hour and a half, I was able to whip out these um, objects, very much like sketching in my sketchbook. But these are low poly versions of the research that I've done in um, Google Images. Um, and the advantage is that uh, not only am I better understanding these objects, how they're constructed, um, but also, I, I end up with as a byproduct is I end up with 3D models of them, which I could conceivably use in my concept models. So um, that's exactly what I did. I just took all these things that I created. I had a mocked up a simple ride track for my, my uh, fictional dark ride. And um, I was able to build a little scene using the props that I had been researching. And this really tells me very, very quickly how many props I'm going to need uh, and whether or not some props can be repeated over and over again, like swords and spears and shields and barrels. So I don't necessarily need a unique item for every single thing. I actually can, can reuse pieces. Uh, it, as an artist, it really helps me uh, come up with um, a better idea of what the environment's going to feel like. And even better, now I have sort of an underdrawing that could be used for a POV illustration and whether I'm doing it or another artist is doing it. We're all, we already have this common language of the 3D model and all the props that we've uh, generated, I've generated uh, for that model. Another way in which to research is that if you're given an assignment that's based upon an existing property, an IP, or a historical place, 
is to uh, to sit down and and sketch it. In this case, this is for uh, DreamWorks How to Train Your Dragon, and I sat down one weekend, um, uh, brewed up some tea, and uh, watched the show. And then, as I was watching it, I would pause and I would draw various bits of detail and information, uh, things that I was noticing that were specific about the design. And because the people working on that film were world builders, they were um, they were constructing the la visual language of the uh, the film. You know who these characters were and where do they live. And by doing these sketches, I'm kind of um, deconstructing it, understanding myself what that journey was. And although I have the movie and I could grab screenshots, and I also have the art of books, which I could also um, mine for information, and I do. Because I've gone through this process, if I need to make something new, I'm building it based upon a language that has already been established and that I've observed while watching the films. So on another project, I needed to create theme lighting fixtures for a Shrek attraction. So I sat, once again, spent a weekend, watched all four films, and decided I was going to draw every single light fixture that I saw in the films. And uh, what's amazing, uh, revelation, is that uh, there aren't a lot of them. Um, the advantage to CG films is that lights don't have to exist physically to illuminate, so these sets are beautifully lit with invisible lights, that, so the light source is, is kind of unknown. And whenever they do have a prop light in the scene, I've noticed that they reuse props a lot. So a light fixture like the one in the center at the Scoured Apple may appear in all four films may potentially unchanged. They've got it, they've built it, why not use it? And then to replicate it, it's a matter of cutting it and pasting it and moving it around. So, so this is also very, very helpful, just like the other films, is discovering the language of light fixtures for uh, a project. Um, another place that's really valuable is Pinterest. Um, uh, the line is being blurred more and more between what's Pinterest and what's Google Image Search, but the advantage to Pinterest is that you can create uh, pin boards where you can just focus in on um, on uh, the details for whatever project you're working on. In fact, you could have many uh, pin boards. And I found that uh, the search engine for uh, Pinterest is actually more spot on uh, when it comes to finding really specific things because it is looking for uh, for things like Dickensian storefronts or for barrels or for old shipping trunks or whatever it is, you can really, really start to build a rich visual library. And what's even better is you can share this library with other people so that you're doing a lot of research, you can share that research with others. Another thing that um, uh, virtual uh, uh, blackboards or virtual whiteboards are out there, Mural is one of them. I think Mural is an incredible, incredible tool, especially for collaboration, especially as we're more and more working remotely. Uh, the only problem is it has a weird, weird pricing structure that uh, makes me not super happy with, with them. Um, there are competitors coming out and hopefully at some point we will have a sort of universal standardized whiteboard uh, service uh, that we pay you know, a little bit uh, and have all have access to that allows us to share information and best of all, share that information in real time during a meeting. So I do recommend Mural or a pro project products like that. I haven't found one yet that is perfect, uh, but uh, Mural is close to it. Um, also, if you're looking for information specifically about theme park stuff, uh, Wikiit. You know, um, there are fans out there who have dissected these attractions and have pulled out uh, nuggets of information. So if someone said, Haunted Mansion, how long is the track length? Well, it's 960 feet long. You know, what's the duration? It'll tell you that. Um, you do have to do some digging, but uh, in your detective work, you want to better understand how these attractions are working. And uh, the Internet's a wonderful place to start to find that out. Um, and then ride-through videos are incredible ways to educate yourself as to what exists out there. And there is just an army of very talented uh, fans of theme park attractions with incredible low-light cameras who have documented pretty much anything that you could imagine out there in the world. And I've also found that if you happen to have a VR headset and you can load up YouTube videos, a lot of these videos are like 4 or 8K. Um, blow the screen up the size of an IMAX screen, tuck your chair right up to them, and then play these videos. And, you know, nothing is better than flying in a plane and being in Florida to ride in an attraction. But 
if that's not going to happen or you're not going to be in Shanghai any, anytime soon, uh, do start to educate your eye by looking at uh, these ride-through videos. And when you're doing that, start asking yourself questions about what you're looking like. Is the story well told? Do you feel you're being, you're being a, a, a detective, but you're also being a critic? What is it about this attraction that works, and what is it that doesn't work? Um, uh, how do the size of the shapes and the location and the color of the propings um, help support the story being told? Is it a consistent story? Are these props uh, feel like they all live in the same world? Um, and, and also, when is it not working for you? Um, ask the question as to whether or not the, the, the technology necessarily to, to transport people into these stories is um, completely hidden, or is it really, really obvious? I'd say that if I had a really, really good idea of what the ride system looked like that was propelling me through a Harry Potter attraction, I probably wouldn't have gotten on it because it looks scary. Um, but it is, it is darn invisible when you're actually on the attraction. Um, they do an excellent job of hiding the fact that this amount of machinery and robot arms are uh, what's propelling you from one scene to the next. And then this is a bad picture of it because I couldn't find one. This is from the original Imagination Pavilion in um, Epcot. Although a classic and much loved and much missed attraction, one of the things that's not remembered is that the track was really quite evident especially in those rooms that were highly illuminated. So um, as wonderful as the scenery was, there were some times where if you were sitting up front, you had a view of what was not necessarily an attractive ride system. It looked a little bit like you were looking at the underside of a centipede. Um, uh, we're able to sort of blot that out a lot, but sometimes those ride systems can uh, potentially uh, call attention to themselves. And one place that that can happen, but doesn't always, is with trackless ride systems. Ask yourself whether or not the, the technology that you're asking for is in service of the attraction and a story you're trying to tell or not. And so what can happen with uh, trackless ride systems is because of the braking distance and because of the ability for the vehicle to move anywhere, the amount of egress space necessary for you to get out safely means that the scenery often gets pushed way, way, way to the side. So you end up with a very, very a large, flat, often shiny sort of a super, super flat uh, concrete surface, um, often with the, the shadow of the, the wheels that have, um, have driven across it multiple times. And, um, and it can sometimes feel like you're in a big warehouse that has the, the scenery uh, vignetted from one place to the next. Also, that shiny floor can also uh, draw attention to itself because shininess will, will reflect the, the thematic lighting. So trackless ride systems, when done right, are incredible, uh, but there are examples of where they've been done. In, I think they've been chosen because the idea of having uh, freedom to move around anywhere um, is, uh, outweighs whether or not that was the best choice for the story you were trying to tell. And then ask the question as to whether or not the vehicle disappears completely. Is it the boat in Pirates of the Caribbean, which is basically not themed, or is it highly themed and really, really integral to the story you're trying to tell? So there are no right or wrong answers, but it's great to start making observations like that so for your project you can decide which is the best choice to support the story you're trying to tell. So one of the big secrets to starting any prog pro project is that but often you're being asked to design something you've never designed before using a technology you've never used before. And one way to start is to go find equivalents because out in the world someone has probably done something very similar to what you're, you're planning on doing, whether it's a similar ride system, a similar capacity, uh, or a similar story. So uh, study what other people have built as sort of a pushing off point for what you're going to do and also a communication tool for the other team members who, who uh, uh, you want to understand the direction you're trying to go in. Um, and, and it's okay that you don't know. So making uneducated guesses allows you to get started. You can always adjust and you can uh, find out information or you can um, sit down with the experts later, but don't allow the I don't know if I know what the answer is to stop you. Make a guess. Um, and it can be a wrong guess, uh, but at least uh, making guesses means that you're starting 
to work and not sitting around waiting for someone else to do something before you can start to work. One of the places for, for equivalence is hunt around for blueprints. There's definitely a chance that uh, an equivalent attraction to the one that you're thinking of, of designing exists in the world in some form um, that you can pull the information from. And there are hobbyists and people out there who, just as the thing that they love to do, um, hunt down blueprints and then recreate them or reproduce them. Um, one of my favorites is a guy named Ed who goes by um, Enfield, Enfilm, sorry, who's uh, on uh, Flickr. He's also searchable through uh, uh, Google image searches. And he's gone through the process of documenting and cleanly redrawing in CAD um, some of the most iconic attractions, both at Disney and Universal. And this is just a great way to become educated in not only how ride tracks are laid out, but also how queues are laid out and, um, and how buildings are, are, are constructed. So here's an example of Haunted Mansion's um, ride system. Uh, this is just a treasure trove for a designer, especially one who may have ridden the ride in various places, to understand things like distances and uh, vehicle lengths and turning radiuses and size of scenes and back of house. Um, this is your education. This is your university where you're going to pull that information that you're not going to necessarily be recreating the Haunted Mansion, but boy, you're going to be running into problems that were solved by an attraction like this, that it makes it worth your while to, to start hunting that down for whatever project you're working on. And also there are examples of actually vintage uh, for for whatever reason, someone has gotten their hands on um, some some dusty and maybe not well produced uh, blueprints from uh, famous attractions. Um, they're usually bits and pieces, and often they're asking to to sell them to you in a package or a PDF. And um, I don't encourage you necessarily going out and buying them, but even in their thumbnail images, you can start to derive information. So in this case, you've got the stretching hallway at the top, and you've got the, the, the well from the Pirates of the Caribbean, and being able to see um, cross-sections and dimensions and heights, even in this fuzzy sort of JPEG uh, way, um, is, is going to help your brain better understand not only how these classic attractions were built, but also to help you understand how the concepts were communicated to the people responsible for building it. So definitely keep your eyes out for them. They're harder and harder to find, but worth looking for. Another thing you can do is if you do find either recreated uh, plans or some of these vintage plans, uh, one of the ways I like to play with it and better understand it is I'll just actually build a simple model that replicates a section of it uh, so that I can, can better understand the relations. I may have ridden an attraction, but being able to see it in dimensions is really, really helpful uh, for understanding how these things were constructed. And even better, now we have the ability of dropping inside the attraction itself that we've built, even in its rudimentary state, um, with the blueprint still on the floor. And whether we're taking a rendering of it or we're using VR to um, walk around in here, um, all of this is valuable and all is benefiting your sort of internal memory and understanding of how these things are built. So that means that you could take uh, uh, an attraction even as simple as uh, Snow White's uh, Scary Adventure, this, this colored bubble diagram I basically took off of a, uh, of a blueprint I found online and just colored it up in, um, in Photoshop and um, uh, built it to scale because it had a scale on it. And now I have a better understanding of how this attraction uh, functions from the load area to the various scenes. And it's also worth mentioning that, uh, that in many cases, a large percentage of the attraction is taken up by the vehicle maintenance. So making sure that you have a room where the vehicles can pop in and out of when they're being maintained. It's very much like designing a restaurant where you realize just how much square footage of that restaurant is going to be taken up by the kitchen, which the customers will never see. So this is always very, very valuable for your brain. Another place to get information is to Google Earth. is a fantastic way to understand equivalence. What's out in the world, you can go pretty much anywhere in the world and find the information um, based on um, how it physically lives in the world. Um, one way to better understand it and find equivalent information is by turning Google Earth to 2D mode and then using their measuring tool 
you can actually measure the dimensions of a show building or attraction or a queue or a whole park um, from uh, right inside Google Earth. And that's really, really great for helping you understand how big the structure is that you're going to be building or what the support facility is. And, and what were the support facilities necessary to run the attraction you are familiar with as you're starting to design this attraction that no one's ever designed before. And another thing that's valuable is if you turn the 3D function and you get the 3D building versions, if you hover the, your, your cursor over the, the, the model, um, it will tell you the height, uh, the elevation of that surface in relationship to sea level. So let's say that the roof of the Haunted Mansion here at Disneyland is 160 feet, and let's say that the, the, um, the, the concrete uh, or the asphalt in behind it is 100 and 40 feet that you can figure out that basically the, the building height is around 20 feet tall. Um, it may not be exact blueprint dimensions, but boy, it really helps you understand the, the size and the height of the things that were used in attractions that you've experienced before and whether or not if those felt like big vast spaces, yours will feel that way uh, purely because you're starting to reference and potentially use these same dimensions in your attraction. Another thing that can happen is that, is that you're going to go find information like you want to see the outside queue uh, on an attraction. And, um, but since Google tends to take these pictures when the weather's nice, which is in the summertime, often if there's trees in the queue, the, uh, the trees have grown, you can't see anything. So um, some of those dimensions could be obscured by foliage. I found that if you play with the history, you can actually slide in and out of um, various um, aerial photographs that have been taken of the same place and you might find that in the 60s there's this grainy black and white picture but it was taken in the winter time where the queue is visible and so uh, play around with the history function of Google Earth so that you can, can better uh, find those nuggets of information about a physical place that you could base that information on your own attraction and also Google Street View is incredibly valuable for better understanding not only the place you're going to build in, but if it's referencing some historical place, or if even if it's referencing um, an attraction that already exists in another park, odds are somebody has gone to that place, taken 360 photos of it, and you can load it up and stand in the street and look around. And if you happen to have a VR headset, which is whether it's a cheap one or it's a, a more expensive one, um, many of them offer the ability to load up uh, Google Street Views so that not only are you looking around, but you're actually standing on the street. And there's just something about standing in the space, looking around, that fills you with information and knowledge that no matter how many still images you look at on uh, Google Image Search, it's not as valuable as standing there. And of course, if you can hop on a plane and physically go to a place, that's the absolute best. There have been many a trip that I have sort of complained about the boondoggle nature of you know us getting in a plane flying thousands of miles to go stand in a place but physically being in a place just is um, utterly invaluable not only for you as an individual but the shared experience of a team being in that space together and sort of soaking up the atmosphere and the realities of the, the space there's observations that are going to happen if you're physically there that you won't have um, if you're just looking at stills. But Google Street View gets you a little bit closer to that experience. Another thing too that not a lot of people know about is Google Earth also offers a free ability to, uh, to generate videos based upon um, their Google Earth models. Um, and it, it, it's called uh, Google Earth Studio. It works only with Chrome, but it works on Macs and PCs. And it generates um, individual files that then can be put together as um, a video. And this is a a great way to better understand uh, the place you're going to be designing within, but it also is a great presentation tool to help you, your client understand where in the world you're going to be either referencing or you're going to be placing this attraction that you are designing. Another place to find information is do patent searches that used to be near impossible, but now Google offers patent.google.com, which has done the job of sort of documenting all patents. Um, especially the old ones. The challenge with patents is they tend to be vague. So you, you can't go in there and search for haunted mansion ride vehicle or doom buggies. They don't name it things like that. They're like, 
you know, linear conveyance with rotary assembly, something or other. They're going to have names that are not going to be easy to search. The good news is that there are fans who have gone out there who have done the hard work of finding what these patents are. And we're not, I'm not suggesting that you go to these patents so that you can replicate them, but you go to these patents so you can understand how they're constructed so that you can make you know, somewhat educated guesses when you're sitting down with an engineer or a you know, ride engineer or a, a vendor or the, the show ride department in your, in your company and have a conversation about the realities of just how much machinery is necessary to do the thing you want it to do. Um, it's just going to make you a better designer. Um, also, you can search for ride vendors. Uh, ride vendors are promoting their ride systems. There are dozens of them in the world. Some are uh, more uh, prolific than others. And, and although they used to do it more than they do now, uh, many of them uh, posted dimensions and uh, schematics and specs on the various ride systems to sort of help designers conceive and imagine what their ride system might look like if we use that particular vendor on our project. So hunt around for that. It takes a little bit of time, but it's worth it. If you can better understand the scale of a ride vehicle uh, when in your design, you're already becoming more realistic when it comes to the realities of moving that ride vehicle through uh, an attraction. Uh, and on some occasions, especially if you're working on a project, is you can contact them directly and ask for the information. In this case, because I was doing this presentation, I contacted Mac. And after several letters of correspondence assuring them that I wasn't going to, to steal anything but use it for an educational purpose, I was able to get uh, some schematic um, blueprints of, of one of their coasters. And I believe this is the same coaster that was used for the Slinky Dog um, uh, coaster. And I could be incorrect. But uh, anyway, so I got this information. And then from this information, I built a very, very, very simple model that just is uh, the same um, dimensions. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to see uh, what it would look like on a curved surface. And also, I wanted to use it as the foundation of an illustration. So once I did that, I just did a drawing over the top of it. And although this is not getting to the technical realities of what I've drawn, it's already getting way, way closer to communicating um, how and what ride system we would use to uh, potentially come up with a finished uh, ride vehicle that's um, highly themed like this. Another way to approach ride vehicle design, if for some reason you just cannot find any vendor who's willing to give you information or, not, or specs, is that in reality, these, all these ride vehicles are going to have human, bottom, you know, human beings sitting with, on their bottoms in them. So um, humans come in a variety of dimensions, but they're all similar. You know, we all have waists and legs, and we sit, and we have to get in and out, and we have to be safe. So starting with an avatar and building in a seated position and building a ride vehicle, it may not be the final ride vehicle, but it's going to get you started so that you can start imagining how how many people you want to push through the space, how, you know, what the distance is between the vehicles, what they're going to see, what the experience is going to be like for that person. Um, and you can always go back and bring in the real specs when you are further down in the project and you're starting to talk to vendors and talk to uh, engineers about the realities of the vehicle. But starting with the size of an avatar is a, is a completely bona fide way to go, especially in the first days of concept. So um, doing rudimentary models of ride vehicles um, helps you to be able to sketch over the top of them and then uh, imagine what the theming might look like if it was applied to the, the top of a functional uh, ride system. Um, that This can at least begin the conversation. Um, it's also really important that when you're doing concepts that you include your research as part of it. So in this particular case, these, um, these, these old wicker uh, wheelchairs, these Victorian wheelchairs, were the inspiration for a ride system but that I also pulled uh, information from the web of a ride system that, that kind of functioned. Uh, it's a, an old bus bar ride system that you, you might find at a carnival. Um, and uh, although it's easy to imagine that, that the most valuable part of this conversation is the, the artwork that's describing what it is, but equally important is the reference that got you to that point. Because you're going to be communicating to a variety of disciplines, and you want them to understand what your intention was. And nothing does that better than bringing them along the path of your concept so that they understand how you got to this finished drawing. 
Same is true with off-the-shelf things, is that um, very often, especially when it comes to food uh, or something that involves uh, very, very strict standards, um, start your design based on something that exists or a vendor that exists. So uh, taking images off their website and then building your concept around it doesn't mean that you might not have a custom um, something built for you, but by starting with uh, something that is a known entity that has been researched, that health departments have said are okay, uh, and then applying your theming to it is a, is a great example of um, what's possible. Um, and it starts the conversation really early. So this example of, of, a, of a, I think it's Shanghai, it could be Tokyo, uh, but it's a, a wonderful example of what was uh, inevitably uh, underneath this a, a, a standard off-the-shelf popcorn vending, you know, uh, cart, um, but then was uh, themed to blend in with the frontier land theming. And I think it does a fabulous job. It, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of scrutiny. I mean, I don't remember ever seeing this in the Wild West, but as far as your, uh, your guests are concerned, this blends in and adds to the ambiance of this land. And it's fun and funny and has props on it. And... Um, suggests the, the, the business that is being purveyed from this particular place with their dried corn and their drawer of salts and spices and stuff. So, so this is a wonderful example of, of um, not starting fresh but building off of something that someone is already manufacturing and may be manufacturing for you. Another place to find information is through um, SketchUp's 3D Warehouse. I use this mostly for scale things. Um, uh, it, it, is, uh, it can be dangerous in that since you don't have any control over who built or how many polygons or how potentially broken the model, free model is that you're using, um, I recommend these especially for, uh, for better understanding the scale of the project you're working on. Um, but if you're going to keep anything from it, I would recommend rebuilding it and then throwing away the one that you've gotten from the 3D warehouse because you'll, infinite, you'll have infinitely more control over something you built than you will on the choices made uh, for, for, by another. Um, as valuable as these are, I've had models that work just fine and then inexplicably crashed and broke a lot whenever one of these models lived in it. That's a rare case, but it's just worth keeping in mind to, to not willy-nilly go and pull stuff in like, oh, I don't have to design a castle because there's tons of them in here. Um, it's also really good for understanding scale. So even if your project doesn't going to actually use the model that um, you find in the 3D warehouse. This was for a water park we worked on recently, and it was um, all, the building was already designed. We were just theming it, and I wanted to better understand how big this building was, so I grabbed a model of the Hindenburg, and I parked it inside of um, the building. In fact, I, I probably could have squeezed two Hindenburgs side by side inside this space. So it's a great tool for helping you understand the scale of something uh, based upon something that you're familiar with or better yet that the team or the client is familiar with. So um, uh, finding a scale uh, for a, a, a drawing um, uh, and more importantly not just finding the scale but understanding and relating to the scale uh, can be done using SketchUp. And so um, I've created this little pre-recorded bit of, um, of me showing the technique for finding a, a drawing, whether it's given to you by a mem team member, an architect, a client, or you just found it on the web. Here's a way to quickly understand the scale of something so that you can better relate to how you're going to design it. So I'll let this, this run. Okay, I wanted to show you really quickly um, how you can use SketchUp to find out the scale of something, especially finding out the scale of something so that you can relate to it more than just looking at it as a drawing by itself. Um, I'm not going to try to teach SketchUp, I'm just going to show you how quickly this is done and how helpful it is. So I'm going to quickly just put a rectangle here, I'm going to flip the normal or the surface uh, so that it is white and not blue. I'm going to bring in the Winnie the Pooh plan that we found on the internet. There we go, and it's going to come in as a texture. I'm going to click OK, and then I'm going to apply that texture to this rectangle. At this moment, it doesn't matter what scale it is. I just want to get it big enough so I can see it, so I'm going to position it. So 
So I'm going to grab this corner and drag it to here and pin it there and drag this to here. Then I can click away from it. And I've got sort of doubled here, so I'm going to just slice off this piece here. Okay. And this is still editable. I want this to sort of not be. I want it just to be like a, a floor mat or a rug. So I'm going to turn this into a component. I could also turn it into a group. Okay, so that's just the plan. It's, it's really just, just a surface for me to work from. The most important thing about this is that this plan um, has a scale in it. And as long as anything in the drawing somewhere has a scale in it, and it could be as simple as a doorway just tells you how wide it is, then in SketchUp you can actually change the scale of whatever you have in your model to be that scale. So right here, this drawing thankfully has this scale and it tells me it goes from 0 to 64. If I take this uh, measuring tape and I click on the 0 and I drag up here and click to the 64 and then immediately type in 64 feet and hit return, it says, do you want to resize the model? And I absolutely do. This is what's going to happen. I'll click on this and I'll, it's going to become huge. So now if I take this uh, measuring tool and I go like this, it shows me in the lower right hand corner that I'm just about 64 feet, um, which is what I want. So now I have a surface that is as big as this Finnish Winnie the Pooh ride would be in person, but it's still kind of hard to understand what that means because it just looks like a drawing. I want to get a person in here so I can understand the scale. And I have another model that I can open up that just has a 3D person and a ride vehicle just to help me understand the scale. Okay, I'm going to copy that. And let's, let's move this around so I'm standing here by the queue and I'm going to paste these two in. So there they are. I'm going to rotate the vehicle so that it is so that, oops, in the loading area right there. And let me just move my little person here, my scale person here. So now I'm having a better idea of the size of this attraction based upon the pieces that I put in here. Having a person in here really, really helps. The other thing I can do is, at the moment, this is just a flat surface that's telling me the, the, the size of the space, but I can come in here with my drawing tool and I can take this pencil and I can trace the lines on this drawing. And then I can use the push-pull tool or the extruding pull tool. And let me just pull it up and let's just say that I know that these walls are 16 feet. So I pull it up and then type 16 feet and hit return. That's what a 16 foot wall looks like. Let's say I want to do the same thing over here. Clicking again. And I'm going to just, there we go. So I'm already starting to see, uh, or get an idea of the size of this space. And if I take this little person here and I drop my camera down here, I'm starting to get an idea of what it must be like to be in this attraction. Now, this is really helpful when you want to see how existing attractions look, uh, just to get a better idea of scale, but it's also really good for you laying out your own environments and your own models. You want to be able to relate to the amount of space you have to work with, and absolutely nothing does that better than doing this quick uh, creating a SketchUp model, uh, putting a scale on it, and uh, extruding some walls so you have an, a better idea of how much space you have to work with. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, those are all the tools that I use. Uh, the, 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 the tools that are available to us keep changing and growing. Um, but I would say to, in parting, um, probably one of the most valuable aspects of, of doing research for your project is to, to sketch all the time. Um, if you're an artist and you uh, want your brain filled with information, uh, there's nothing better than sitting uh, or enjoyable, as enjoyable as sitting and 
and sketching out the things that are in front of you, whether, whether they're in your hometown or they're out in the world or they're on a, on a television or uh, in a movie. Um, you will understand the world better by uh, drawing it. Um, it, it. You will never get worse from spending lots of time uh, translating the things that you're seeing in your eyes uh, down on paper. Um, the same is true of sketchbooks when you're, what you're drawing is the things that are appearing in your imagination. So, so wherever you go, uh, sketch um, everywhere and everything, um, including your backyard. These are sketches of, um, of elements in my backyard because I felt like sketching and I, I wasn't on a European tour at that time. So I, I sketched my, beer, my bird bath, my bee bath, bird bath. Um, Thank you very much for following along, and um, let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, uh, when you're given an assignment, jump on in. Don't wait for someone to give you the information that they promised you, because they don't always, uh, and it will make you a better designer in the end. So, thank you.